because coinciding with iPhone's 10th anniversary, we here at the museum are focused on iPhone 360. Um, these initiatives that are looking at um, do documenting iPhone and it's um, from our collections and exhibits to new research and scholarship, dynamic events, as well as creating new education curriculum. On March 2nd, we began our series of events by looking at the prehistory of the iPhone, computing in your pocket here in Silicon Valley. We featured leaders from Apple Newton, Handspring Palm, Go, and General Magic. Tonight, we feature an iconic inventor of iPod and iPhone to explore more about computing for the world and how mobile computing has evolved and where it's going in the future. Next month on June 20th, we'll feature a series of executives, a panel of executives as well as engineers from hardware, software, and user interface who were involved with the original iPhone discussing that, uh, the making of the iPhone technology. This summer and fall, we'll follow with additional events on the iPhone 360, focusing first on the business side of the story, on the global supply chain and the business uh, model, and then secondly, and later in the fall, on the social impact. This project is part of uh, Exponential Center's look at transformational products and companies that really are at this intersection of technology innovation, economic value creation, and social impact. And um, if you are part of the iPhone story, which I think many of you are, we welcome you to help tell this story uh, through your artifacts or video uh, interviews that we are collecting through this uh, year-long project. Uh, feel free to contact me or our curatorial team. We have here Hanson Shu from our Center for uh, Software History, as well as Mark Weber, director of our uh, Internet History program. And also Bob Kettner, proj uh, project manager from iPhone 360 Project. And now, to introduce tonight's speakers. To lead this conversation, who could be better than John Markoff, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist at the New York Times covering business and technology, he is also author of thought-provoking books on personal computing and, and robotics, Machines of Loving Grace, as well as uh, What the Dormouse Said. At the beginning of this year, we're very proud to say that he also joined the Computer History Museum as historian. Please join me in welcoming to the stage John Markoff. Hi, yeah. Good to have you, John. Thank you. <laughs> And I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's uh, featured speaker in his only appearance this year in Silicon Valley. Uh, I would like to bring up to the screen five numbers to introduce him. First of all, 7,279,395,873. This is the number of kilowatt hours saved by Nest thermostat owners. And by the way, that's enough energy to power the average household for 70,219 years. 50, in 2016, time named Nest, iPhone, and iPod among the 50 most influential gadgets of all time. 18, the number of generations of iPod shipped. 300, the number of patents authored. 350 million, the number of iPods sold since it hit stores in 2001. Join me in welcoming the one and only inventor of iPod and iPhone tonight. We are welcome, glad to welcome Tony Fidel. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> now for something entirely different. Exactly, um, something different. So it's, it's, been, it's been two decades um, since uh, Steve Jobs returned to Apple. Um, they would have called it uh, the failing Apple computer at that point. Um, Walt Mossberg had actually written Apple's obituary in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Michael I, Dell. Michael Dell, take the money back it, and give it to the pack shareholders. Pack it up and give it back to the shareholders. And uh, I, I was the beat reporter covering Apple at the time for, for uh, the New York Times. And I wasn't quite so, uh, so sure. Uh, but after Steve came back, pretty quickly, one of the things he did is he made sure that Apple spoke with just one voice. And that was Steve's. And, um, but before he did that, I was able to do one profile of an Apple designer, um, Johnny Ive, uh, and uh, the, the profile ran in the home and garden section of the New York Times. <laughs> uh, I don't think anybody read it but Steve. But, um, and, and then several years later, after the door had really uh, slammed shut, um, I did another story about, the, you know, the, the iPod had become this uh, incredible and unexpected success. And I, and I wrote a story in the Sunday Times about that. 
and I kind of described uh, the role that the gentleman sitting next to me had, and um, that led to several things. Uh, one thing it did was it irritated Steve Jobs, and um, it, it led to me getting a new cycling partner, actually. Uh, and so <laughs> for the last 12 years, we've been riding bikes out to, to, the, uh, to the coast from behind Stanford. I, I just for the record, I'd like to say when we started, I was actually faster than Tony. Uh, <laughs> sadly, sadly, that's no longer the case. Um, I, I think that's, that's because he moved to France where they, you know, there's better training and stuff like that. But, so, so today we're mostly going to talk about building and desi designing and building the iPhone, but I, I wanted to, s to, to, to get into it by uh, asking, so Tony, uh, you know, so let, let's start by talking about how you came to computing. Because I, th I think my sense is that you didn't, I mean, in, in Silicon Valley, I often run into engineers, and they come from families of engineers. I mean, it's like engineers all the way down, or scientists. You had a slightly different... Uh, slightly different. Upbringing. So wh wh where did you come out of? Wh how did you get into an engineering mindset? And I think it was pretty early? It was very early. Um, my grandfather started when I was about three years old, would take me around, and we would... He would show me how to fix things in the house. So much to my grandmother's chagrin and my mother's chagrin, I was sitting there like changing electrical outlets at three and four years old, like fixing that or fixing plumbing with him or painting a wall or something. And then, he, then as my brother got older, we would do that together with him. So every weekend or evening, he would just go, hey, we're going to go do this together. We're going to do that. And so he would take us around and just teach us how to use tools and hammers and saws and power tools. And, you know, every time my mother's like, have they lost a finger yet? You know, or whatever. So it was always this, you know, we were always immersed in, he, he, he was from a generation from the, you know, the Depression, Great Depression. So he had to do everything himself. And what was, what was he by profession? Or so interestingly enough, my my grandfather was a teacher and, and a professor, and then he was a superintendent of the Hamtramck School District in Detroit. And so it was education? Was so he was education the entire time. So he did that, and then in his off time, he would have uh, like vocational training to get the truants off the street back in the, in the 40s. He would bring them in, and then he would train them on doing auto work or woodwork or something like that. So part of your time you were in Michigan, but, but a lot of time you moved around too. I went to 12 schools in 15 years. So it was always, we were always moving back and forth. Your dad wasn't in the army. <laughs> no, my dad was not in the army. My dad was in the rag business, in the clothing business. Yeah. And so he wor worked with Levi's as head of sales in different parts of the U.S. all the time. We would move every two to three years to different places to... So w when did you bump into computing for the first time? So for me, I saw it the very earliest days in about 1979, 79. We had just moved back to Detroit from Rochester, New York. And there was a computer class. It was a summer computer class. It was in fourth grade or something. And it, I, I was like, we had heard about this thing called the computer, you know, it was in kind of in the popular press, and I was like, I don't know what it was, but I was like, I got to do that. My parents go, they didn't know what it was either. It's like, okay, sure, it was a summer school. And literally we had, it was an IBM 360 mainframe somewhere, uh, and then we had uh, paper terminals. It was just paper terminals and a card reader, bubble card. So we would sit there and we would put in all so the... it was some kind of basic? And it was basic. And we'd do basic, and we'd make the stack, and we'd do, you know, 10, print, blah, go to, tw you know, 20, go to 10, yeah. and, you know, this kind of thing. And you have your stack of cards. And I was instantly hooked, right? And then we'd play Oregon Trail, and, and that was fourth grade, right? And I was like, wow, this is great. So the Apple II was out in the world, but that was not your first exposure to computer. No, that w the very first thing was that yeah. paper terminal. And, and I could, like, make things and draw things. I was like, this is cool. Yeah. You know, and then I, I was like, I got to have a computer. And after that was, and my grandfather had taught me all about tools and everything. And he didn't know anything about computers at all. But he saw it as a modern day tool. And he's like, you're really into that. And he's like, and I go, and it was like $2,500, $2, right? To get an Apple II 
back then with a green screen. And he was, and I was like, I need to have it. And it, so he said, look, you go out and work this summer, and I will match whatever you make to help you get the computer. And so by the end of the summer, I was a caddy, and I was caddy, carrying bags, you know, golf clubs, working my ass off, carrying two bags of clubs, and, you, know, you know, multiple rounds a day. And he matched it, and we went to computer land in St. Clair Shores, Michigan, and I was, you know, my 48K Mac, or Mac, excuse me, 48K Apple, Apple II, II yeah. right? And then brought it home, and it was my life. You were 12? What was 11? It was 11. 11. Yeah. yeah. 11. But it wasn't, uh, you, it wasn't all gaming at that point. You were not a hardcore gamer, or were you a hardcore gamer? I, you know, it was just, it was just after Atari, I think. So we had Atari, you know, playing around. We had a Fairchild system yeah. way back when, a Fairchild gaming system. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I was in it, but it was kind of out of it. And it was really the Apple II. And then I could make my own games and, and do all kinds of stuff with so, it. So, but, and pretty quickly you got to, uh, to your first startup. How quickly? <laughs> oh, so I, then we moved to Dallas. And in Dallas, yeah. I needed to stay in touch with all my friends that I had back in Michigan. So that's when I got a 300 baud modem. And that's when we started phone freaking. And we were hacking, you know, Sprint and MCI were the like latest things and you had codes and all this stuff. So we started hacking the phone system so I could call my friends back in Michigan because it was way too expensive. So, but not, not with blue boxes. No, they weren't blue boxes. It was just, we were doing, we were running computer programs to try to find the codes that Password. worked with, Password. right, yeah. you know, to, to get in. So how did that lead, lead to a business? So the other guy, another guy that I knew, he was running a BBS on his Apple II back in Michigan. So I would log on to the BBS. So I was saying, oh, well, we were in, so we were in Dallas for ninth grade and 10th grade. Or no, no, 10th and 11th grade. And I was like, oh, I'm coming back to Michigan for senior year. Because I went to four different high schools. So I was like, I'm coming back. And he's like, and this guy's like, I'm starting this business. And he was just one year older than me. So he had just graduated. I'm starting this business selling Apple II gear. Do you want to join me? And I'm like, absolutely. And it turned out what we were doing is we were buying all these applied engineering cards from, you know, Texas back in the day, which I was in, right, because applied engineering was in Plano, Texas, where I was living. And we were buying it, and then we were writing software to make those Apple II cards, the applied engineering cards, run more efficiently. So that was assembler at that point? What were you how we were doing? We were doing actually uh, Pascal and assembly. Yeah. So we're doing Pascal and assembly and creating um, software to help you put in the, the bigger memory boards and do, uh, you know, Apple works, okay. you know, make Apple so works run all, in bigger memory. All self-taught at this point. All, well, truth be told, I went to computer math class. Back then we had computer math class, right? And this was in 1981, I think it was. Okay. Computer math is what it was called. And I went every day because I wanted to go. But I got thrown out of class every day in computer math class. Because? Because either I was like, that's not the way you do it. You do it this way. So I either got thrown out in the first two minutes or I got thrown out in the last five minutes or I would help the girls like program their stuff or blah, 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 blah. Like I was always like causing trouble. So my parents had to come to school, <laughs> talk to the teachers, and the principal, and they said, okay, you're going to do a language, but you're going to do Spanish and French. We're going to take you out, and you're going to run the computer math club after school. Okay. So that was the whole thing. So I couldn't go to that class anymore, but I could, like, run my own class after school. So, so what happened to the business? Did you make money? Yeah, absolutely. So in the business, so we, it was just the two of us, and we bought all the stuff, and then we had, to, we had Apple Insider Magazine and all those crazy things. And so we would make our own ads and have them printed, and then we had a phone line, right? And people would send in, you know, on a, you know, a, a envelope, they'd send in their orders with their checks, and then we would ship it out with our software and what have you, and we were doing hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales a month. So what happened to the business when you went to school? So I, I continued to program and do stuff from school, and then ultimately, um, 
it was turning into educational software. So we were going really educational. All the educational uh, schools needed this stuff. Which you were buying and reselling or you were writing? We were buying and reselling and writing. We were doing all of that stuff and doing all the customer support for it. And so he wanted to continue the business, said, that's fine, but I want to go to some other things. And he ultimately grew up to like 80 people in St. Clair Shores. We were doing millions of dollars in business a month, reselling, and then it got into the Mac and stuff like were, that. Were you, in, were, you, were you in college by this time? I was in you, college. You stayed. So I stayed on for another, for freshman year, because I did the, app, the Apple Fests and the Mac Fest, you know, the, the computing yeah. conventions, and we would have a booth and all that stuff. And it was it, crazy. Had you become a fanboy by that time? Oh, I had been a fanboy like, you know, way before, before I had my first Apple II, and then it, it was sunk in, right? And so you, you get to college, and what are you going to be? What, oh, I knew what I was going to be. I didn't even know I was going to go to college. Actually, um, I decided that I wasn't going to go to college. I decided we were going to do this business, and we were going to continue the startup and, you know, figure out where I was going to go, because I was like, yeah, I wasn't really enamored with it. And then, literally 48 hours before I was graduating from high school, the acceptance letter came from U of M. And I was like, okay, <laughs> why not? And so that's what I did. And, and, the first, and the first two weeks of school, I wasn't even there. Okay. Because, because you were doing business? Because I was at Apple Fest in Boston, okay. setting, we were driving out, setting up the things. And then, you know, I told my parents, I'm like, hey, they're like, where are you? I'm like, Boston. <laughs> they're like, we're paying to send you to college. What the hell? It's the first two weeks of school. I wasn't even there. Like, it, it, it was just always on the brain. So, but you were sort of on a double E trajectory right from the start? Uh, so, computer engineering from the start. Absolutely. So, computer engineering was a hardware major and a, a CE major. So, both, or EE and okay. CS major. Yeah. Dual. And so, your, one of your mentors, was he your signif most significant mentor was Elliot Soloway, who's sort of a big What's name. Cool? But did you know him as an educator or as a computer guy or? I knew him as a computer guy. So I took my first class with Elliot Soloway. Um, it was my junior year. And it was make an app. So it was like make an app class. So like just figure out what you want to build, make the pitch, then build the app, and then you know demo it at the end of the semester. So the IBM PC was in the world by this time? The Mac was IBM not? was in the world, and actually we did the class project for on, that, the on, the, on the PC at that point. Yeah. Uh, t tell us a little bit. I mean, Soloway is an important guy in terms of sure. education and computing. So he worked, uh, so he was out of Yale. So Soloway went to Yale, and he was underneath, um, I can't remember his professor now. Um, but it was all about education and computing, how to get uh, computers into education and to take, you know, uh, pedagogy into the digital world, right? And he started very, very early days of working with high schools and younger, uh, younger kids to try to see how these tools could be used to help them further their education. And he worked on it for decades. He still works on it today. Right, so probably 50 years now he's been in the field. Yeah. And he was doing all kinds of fundamental research with his team at University of Michigan, but at the same time he taught the one class, which was this kind of introductory to application programming and kind of what it takes to work as a team to build programs. So we did the, you know, um, Mythical Man Month. We would read the, you know, Brooks book, Mythical Man Month, and he would do certain things about the software process, not just about the actual, you know, the, the, the coding piece. And while you were an undergraduate, the Mac came out? Yes, it and did. So it's a computer, but... No, no, the Mac came out not when I was an undergraduate. The Mac came out when so I was in high school. High school, okay. It was a wonderful tool for making fake IDs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> We made fake IDs. It was great because you had a laser writer, right? Yeah. And you could make, and I, so I had a business <laughs> making fake IDs on the laser writer. So it was, and it was highly profitable. But you knew about it as a project. Did you also know about the team? How much, how soon did you learn about the team and that it built the Mac? I mean, that, I knew that about it like, of... well, look, we all sat and waited for the commercial, the 1984 commercial to come out, right? Because, and I was also like, I had, I already had my Apple II, and then the two plus came, and then the two E came, and I'm like, I can't afford all these things. It was like <laughs> driving me, driving me nuts, right? And then I'm like, what's this Mac thing, no. you know? 
And, um, and so the Mac came, and I just couldn't afford yet another Mac. But luckily, our high school in Texas, we had this lab of, we had this huge lab of, I can't remember, but they were some kind of crazy PC clone. And then they had a, like four Macs. Never used the PC clones. We did Pascal on that. But we did, we did that. Um, we, did the, uh, we did the Mac. Did you, I mean, but you made it all the way through college. You didn't bail. You didn't, like, drop out. I almost bailed. To do. And, and it was thanks to Elliot Soloway. So when Elliot, at the end of the class, you know, after that, I said, I want to do this stuff. And I showed it to him. And he was like, this is great. Blah, blah, blah. You know, we got whatever grade we got. Then I go, look, I got this idea. I want to do this. And it was all about multimedia. Because I had watched where Andy Hertzfeld went to Radius, and they were having the Radius cards and all this stuff. And I'm like, send me to Silicon Valley, Elliot. I'm going to learn about multimedia, and I'm going to come back and build a multimedia lab for you. <laughs> and he's like, what? I'm like, yeah, multimedia, because that's what the kids are going to need, because they're going to want graphics and sounds, and it's going to be engaging for education. And video. And he's like, and that was when the earliest days of QuickTime, right? Yeah. I'm like, because this was 89, I think. And he's like, sure. Okay, whatever. I don't know what this kid wants, but go. So I get on a plane and I come over here and I go meet with Radius and Raster Ops and You're I go get free cards and like a wheel of dealing and I'm like, okay, and then I come back and I build a lab. Okay. And we 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 created a you know kind of early computer vision lab with graphics and we had SGI machines and we were doing VR in '88. Like we made we took the Nintendo Power Glove and we were moving stuff around and I put LEDs on a glove and like with the SGI. So we had this kind of multimedia lab, one of the first ones uh, at the University of Michigan. Did you know you ultimately wanted to get to the Valley though at that point? W at what point did you decide that Silicon Valley was the place to be? That is a great question. Besides Apple being here and everything else, the thing that sold me, I'm so I'm driving around and I'm like, I heard about this thing called fries. <laughs> <laughs> And I like, and then there was Weird Stuff <laughs> Warehouse across the weird street. Weird Stuff, yeah. And Hall Tech was Hall Tech. And Hall Tech. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> let's go and look at this. And I go in, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. It was just like a grocery store of chips. And I'm like, there's nothing like this in Michigan. And I'm walking the aisles, and it was like a superstore. <laughs> then I go across the street, and I can get all this other stuff, and I can make and mix and match. And I'm like, utopia. <laughs> I have found it. Yeah. And it, ever since then, it was like, I got to be here. I got to be here. So you're, this computer engineering, so in, in, in Isaacson's book on Steve Jobs, he refers to you as a brash entrepreneurial programmer. And I thought, what's that? I never really, that's not the way I thought of you. Where did he get that? Well, I think, you know, I kind of, I'm, I'm an ask for, ask for forgiveness instead of permission kind of guy. Like, it just, like, I'm going to do it, like, make it happen. So when I was at, and there's Mark Peratt right there. Hi, Mark. <laughs> when I was at General Magic, you know, the very first, like, second month, the, my boss's boss goes, he's an over-exuberant youth. I don't know what to do with this kid. <laughs> like, I just wouldn't follow any rules. Well, dial back. How did you find out about these guys were a seat? These guys were totally stealth. How did you find out about them? The back of Mac Week magazine. <laughs> you had to read that religiously. Like, every week it would come, and you would read every single word and learn about every single thing going on in the Mac or in the Apple world through Mac Week magazine. Because there was no internet. So I, I talked to Mark before we started. He said there were lots of kids like you knocking on the door, as it turns out. How, 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 did you, how did you get in the door? I guess I was just incredibly crazy and persistent because I just, you know, one time I showed up at 8 in the morning in, on Mountain View in Castro Street when they were there. I was like, Ugh. You have a college degree at this point, You're, or is this before? Oh, no, I, uh, I was just about to get it. Yeah. I was okay. just about to get it, but I was knocking sure? on the door, and I was like, and I go in, and I go in the Castro Street, and I look around, and there's like no one there, and then I'm walking through, and then like, it was clearly someone had been there all night. Like, there was somebody there, but they had been there all night, and they looked at me like, ah, you're like, well, who's this guy? <laughs> I'm like, hey, I'm here, and I have my coat on, you know, and they're like, and they're like, we're not hiring. Leave us alone, kind of a thing. Go away, kid. You know what I mean? And like, and so I was 21 at the time, and so I just kept trying to figure out a way. And then I met a Silicon Valley uh, uh, VC, 
and I said, hey, I need to go and get into General Magic or Apple or somewhere, but I really want to be in General Magic. He goes, I know some people at Apple in recruiting. Let me hook you up with them. So and Apple, even though they were not, Apple was... Well, because there was also Taligent and Kaleida yeah, back yeah. then. You could have ended up at Kaleida. How would the world Well, I had a job <laughs> offer from Kaleida. <laughs> okay. Thank God. Kaleida into the wall. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, it would have been a learning experience. Yeah. Oh, it was, <laughs> you know, so, you know, and, and, and then ultimately they also said, well, we'll also get you hooked up with an interview at General Magic. And I said, like, oh, yes. And so who interviewed you? Everybody. Okay. So did you meet Andy at that point and, yes. and the, the team? Andy and Scott Canaster okay. and David Sloop. They were still in, they were still in stealth at this point. They, they oh, had, totally yeah. in stealth. Yeah. Totally in style. So you know, I walk in and there's a Neo Geo stand-up arcade, go and I'm like, where am I? <laughs> and I have a tie and a jacket on. And everyone's like, take that off. <laughs> you know, and I was like, I, I was just, I was like vibrating. So what, we get, you get hired, what do they have you do? Get hired, it wasn't that easy. <laughs> 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 but the very first thing, I was the lowest guy in the totem pole. Like I just came in, I said, I'll do anything. Just give me something. They're like, here, go make all the diagnostics to, for the new chip that's coming that we're building so that we can know that it works and we can try things for this new chip that was going to power the, the, what became the, the, the general magic magic cap yeah. device. But they weren't at that point, they were building a platform, they were building a system, they weren't really building consumer products. No, no, so it was a they platform had all these partners. company. We had models and we had all this stuff, but it was like, we're going to need the big brands of the world to you know, yeah. take what we're doing and move it out. Yeah. And, and uh, one of the things that always struck me is that, um, I don't know at what juncture, but at some point, um, you sat almost back to back with Andy Rubin um, as, as two, and I mean, it, it, it's stunning to me because, you know, how many years later, there are sort of two platforms in the world. There's, there's you know, iOS and there's Android. Android, yeah. And those sort of the, the seeds of that were in one place like 20 feet apart, 10 feet apart. Yeah, we, you know, we were literally right there, like next to each other, pulling pranks on each other, you know, doing all these things. And, you know, if you think about what was done at General Magic, about hardware, software services, you know, you know the whole kind of ecosystem that was created, that was a formidable time for all of us who were like 27 and uh, younger. And almost all of our careers were defined by that. And we continued to live by that. And... Yeah, if you look at the you know, General Magic PDA, you know, Magic Cap device, it was personal intelligent communicator, sorry, <laughs> Joanna, the pick. Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, it was about, we were just too soon. We were 15 years too soon. But we always knew, we knew we saw that vision and it had to come to light and we just kept working on it. Yeah. Right, because it was so compelling. It was just, we were just so early. Would you have guessed that it was going to take 15 years then? How, how out of Geez, sync Geez, we you? thought we were going to rule the world in 94, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. You, know, yeah. you know, so to know that it's going to take another, basically 13 years after that, yeah. you know, and so you when would it, have never guessed it. When it fell apart, you were young. This was your sort of first major failure? Or, or did it feel like failure? What did it feel like? Oh, when, it felt like failure. Yeah. <laughs> You know, when you're working, like, you come out here and you're going to go work with your heroes and you're, honest to God, you know, 100 to 120 hours a week living there, eating every meal with yeah. this family. We were family, right? And we were so convinced and the world was convinced. And I, I was young. I hadn't seen Silicon Valley failure before, you know, like a lot of other people who were older did. So I just believed it, yeah. right? And you're just like, we're going to make this happen. We're going to will it into the world. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah, when it hits the wall, there's a, you know, existential crisis of like, what is, what does my life mean? And, you know? and, and when it fell apart, were you pushed? Did people like get pink slips or did you jump? No, I, I left. Yeah. I left. So it was bad and things. It's well, we had just gone public. There was all this stuff yeah. going on. So, you know, to the outside world, everything was going fine. But on the inside, you could see things were not what we wanted them to be yeah. because we had a bold, bold vision. And we were so far ahead. This is where I learned that you could have bold vision, but you have to also track the societal mindset of the time, and you can just take them just so far. 
you can't take them so far. Like, you know, with the, the mantra around general magic, right? You know, uh, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so we were so in the future that everybody thought it was magic, but they didn't know what they needed it for. There was no, we couldn't communicate why they needed it. We were like, this is the future. They're like, yeah, good, but I don't need it today. Yeah. Right? You didn't solve any problem that we knew they were going to have these problems. They didn't know they had those problems yet. Yeah. Right? So you have to have this advanced technology, but just ahead of where society is so they can adopt it, and then you leapfrog yourself and pull them forward. But you can't be over here, and then they're like, well, I don't know. Well, you know. So you leave and you take this vision that you've sort of come to be part of this team with you to Phillips, that also is a little bit of a, a wrong turn. Well. Culturally. A Dutch company. Culturally, yes. Yeah. Culturally, yes. But I give them incredible credit because they were partners at General Magic, right? And so I put together a business plan and a product design, and I said, and I went to the CEO of Phillips at the time, and it's, they go, we should be making this. This is what we should do. And I was 25 years old. He's like, sure, go build that. It's like, shit, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> like, I was just an individual engineer. No one was reporting to me. I didn't have a team. Now I had to build an engineering team at 25, and, you know, and, and then we actually built a device and shipped it two years later. So it got into the market. It got in the market. We won all kinds of critical well, awards. This was a community Windows ah. PDA. Ah. What was it? Uh, it was did, the, 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 the Velo. Put did, up oh. the slide. Are there slides for the Yeah, we the have Velo? it. It's there. So you can put it, up it'll the slide. You'll see so how did, it, how did it do? So you, it was a critical success. We blew everybody in the market of those Windows PDAs at the time. We blew them away. Yeah. And um, so we critically success. But then, so the first thing was making sure you design a product that the mar is meeting specific needs that the, pr the market needs and design it in an attractive package and all that stuff. Great. Check. We get critical wins. Check. But then I forgot the other big thing, which is how are you going to sell it and market it? Phillips had no clue. They just wanted to sell TVs. So they were counting on the Wintel marketing prowess to sort of tell. They didn't know what they were doing. To draft on. They just didn't know what they were doing. They were just like, oh, like retailers didn't even know where to put these things. They're, oh, it's a calculator. <laughs> right? Like they just didn't even know because it's, it was so, still so new. But wasn't Microsoft out pushing those things? Wasn't this a big Microsoft push? Uh, didn't, it didn't was a big Microsoft push, but the retailers didn't understand because they saw it as a computer product. There were no computer stores anymore, computer land, everybody. Mm -hmm. So everybody didn't know what it was, right? Because HP had their little like HP computer. Yeah. So that was where it was, but no one knew how to sell it. It was just a whole new category. There weren't that many new categories being created in retail, yeah. right, back then. Now there are, but back then they didn't know how to adapt. So how long before you decided you had to leave? So I was there, well, I was there a total of four years, but I left that group after four three years, years and then went to be a, become a venture capitalist at Philips on the digital trends, because we were investing in TiVo, so I learned about the investing environment and startups and all those other things. That. Okay, but then you decided to strike out on your own. So I watch, I'm watching everybody, all these other people making companies, and I'm watching them get funded, and I'm like, shit, I can do that, right? And that's what happened. It was so, I, so then I, I left Philips, and, and I go, I'm going to write a business plan and then start to create a next generation uh, you know, company. And it was all about, we were trying to build the Dell of consumer electronics. So what was consumer, because I learned that in retail, like, there was the analog to digital transition. HDTV was coming. Uh, there was no LCD screens yet, but there was DVDs were there. And we were like, wait a second. People have to, if they want to put a home theater together, they have to pick the right screen, the right speakers, the right, you know, amps and right things. And they need all the right cables. And it was really confusing and hard. You had to be a real geek to put together a home theater. So I was like, well, you saw what Dell did with PCs to make it easy. So we're going to make the Dell of consumer electronics, and we're going to make a slim box that was going to be, you put your CDs in, it would rip the CDs, and then put them on a hard drive. So Samsung was going to supply the other components. We were going to make an online store where you could select different things, and we were going to have one thing that differentiated it, which was this hard drive, rack mount, MP3 player. But before it happens, you get a call. Not before it happens. 
Oh, it was out, you got into the market? No, so before we shipped it, yes. Yeah, yeah. But we had built it. Yeah. And then we, then 2000 happened, right? The internet blew up. Hardware companies? They weren't funding even software companies in 2000, right? It was like, geez, they were everyone's holding on for dear life, right? Because they're everyone's bleeding cash. Yeah. Hardware companies, they don't want anything to do with it, yeah. right? And they're like, Tony, you're crazy. Go software. What's this? Yeah. And so, so then I couldn't get any more money. And so I get a call from Apple saying, would you consult for us? We need a project done. And I was like, shit, I, this is a way to get money for the startup. So I'll go and moonlight on that to fund it. And that turned out ultimately to be the iPod. That became the iPod, yeah. And, um, but before I go all the way forward, um, how come you didn't, a bunch of GM people, General Magic people, went with Steve Perlman to- Web TV. Web TV, did you ever think about going in that direction? They did Web TV after I started Philips. I see, so you're too early. You're yeah, like, I was already, I was already yeah. into, the, into my next okay. thing. Okay, so um, talk a little, let me, let me ask you about the dial. On, on the uh, on Oh, the, the click wheel? The, the click wheel. wheel. Yeah. Was that part of your original design? Well, you can see it here. Yeah. So this was the, this was the original, this is a picture of the original styrofoam model that I made that was weighted in everything that Steve picked up, and that was the, that was the pitch. So you had six, how, how quickly did you do that? What? How quickly did I you? I did that all in six weeks. Six weeks. Six to seven weeks. Everything I, because I had to get back to the startup my startup. So it was like, how fast can I, <laughs> how fast can I make this to get my money so I can get back to work? <laughs> and he liked it. I mean, it wasn't one of those. Oh, it was, uh, it was, it was a green lighted, now it was green lighted, maybe not to ship, but it was green lighted to go to the next phase yeah. as quickly as possible to see if it, how real this styrofoam thing was. Yeah. Cause I had, I had literally made all this, the components inside. I'm, I made all the Lego blocks that were inside this and you could see how they were pieced together. So I had that um, along with some other models, the ones that were thrown out because they weren't the right design. And where did that capacitive dial idea come from? Well, it wasn't capacitive, it was a mechanical oh, wheel first. Was it really? I've forgotten that. Okay. It was mechanical first and then because we had so many failures in the field and stuff, it went to a capacitive wheel. Okay. Um, so where did it come from? Truth be told, <laughs> now it's so many years later. So. This is, this is what Phil Schiller did, because he was such a fan of Bang & Olufsen. <laughs> they had, it was a Bayo phone, blah, blah, 3000 or something. And it had a wheel on it, just one wheel to select names from a, from a, you know, from a list. And that was the thing, he's like, so I had this thing, and I was like, main control input, and I thought it was just gonna be a up, down, left, right. And then he goes, and then, you know, we, we do all this, and Steve's like, I love it, we're gonna do this thing and everything, and then, but we gotta, we gotta talk about one more thing. And I wasn't an employee at the time, right? I was just a contractor. And then Phil turns to Steve and says, can we bring out this thing? And Steve goes, yeah, you can show him. So Phil runs into Steve's office, grabs the phone and brings it back, the Baocom or Bayo phone, whatever it was, and he goes, this. And they go, can you put that on there? I went, Oh, I know how that works. Sure, I can put that on there. No problem. And they go, so let's go. And I go, wait a second. I got a, so I got a startup. I don't know if I'm joining you. I got other things. You know, you guys can go do this thing. Because remember, Apple wasn't an $800 billion valuation company it is today. Yeah, yeah. It was break even. And still. $500 million in debt, $150 million in the bank. You're like less than 1% market share in the U.S., <laughs> only you're like are you gonna go join this thing <laughs> right so so then there was that moment in this room which has been widely chronicled where they put you on the spot they oh that you. was afterwards but that was where you made your was that literally where you made your decision yes that was literally when I made my decision so who was it, it was Rubenstein who basically sort well of we gotta we gotta tell the story right okay. we can't just you gotta okay might have heard the story but uh, some we gotta know. they gotta tell the whole story so so I was really not sold to go to this computer company that wasn't doing so well. <laughs> um, my, not my, my startup was doing so well, but, uh, but you know, why do I, I was going to commit to that. And so I said, and we had negotiated for like four weeks now, and John and Steve and everyone's getting pissed at me because I'm like, no, I, this isn't right yet. I said, this is not what I want. And so... 
they started to get closer to what I want, but not enough. But I go, look, I want to start meeting all the people who I would be working with. So Phil Schiller, da 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 So I want to meet these people. So they set up a day where I went and met with all kinds of different people around the company for a half an hour to get to know who I'd be working with. And the last person was Steve, right, to sit down and, and do a one-on-one. So da -da 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 -da. And then I'm with Steve. So it's going well, and then Steve's like, and I'm like, Steve, look, I learned from Phillips, you know, if we have enough time and money, we can make anything. But how are you going to sell it? Like Sony's number one in every single auto, audio category. How are you going to sell this thing? Like, I'm not going to waste all my time. And he's like, look, if you can make this, I'm going to put every dollar of Apple marketing behind it. I'm going to stop marketing for the Mac for a little while, and we're going to put all of it behind it. And I'm like, OK. And I'm looking at my watch, and I'm running late, because I'm supposed to go to another meeting where I'm going to unveil this project to Johnny Ive and all of these, uh, jo Greg Joswick and all these other people. There was 35 people waiting. But I got Steve, so I'm going to keep going. So I'm, we're like getting this and so, and so I'm late. I'm like 30 minutes late. I show up to the room. <sighs> all these people look at me. They don't know who I am. They're like, who is this? And they all stare at me and they're all mad because they're sitting there waiting. And John open, oh, oh, looks at me and he goes, are you going to take the job now? <laughs> and I look, and there's these, all these people I don't know anything about. And I'm like, huh? He's like, you need to sign on the bottom line right now on the job, or we're going to cancel this meeting, and it's over. <laughs> and I was like, what? So I turn to the room, and they, they say, and I go, is this how you guys hire everybody at Apple? <laughs> And it was a nervous laughter, and they don't know what the hell's going on either. And I look at John, and I like, I can go, give me what I want, or I was like, I'll say yes, and I'll fix it later. So I just looked at him and I in a deep, like, <laughs> and I went, okay, I'm in. <laughs> Within a nanosecond after doing that and shaking his hand, I fell into complete shock. I was like, bah. And I sat down, and I couldn't give the presentation. All the slides and everything. And back then, we were on like transparencies. Like transparencies yeah, yeah. on a freaking, <laughs> like back then. And, I was like, and so for 20 minutes, I couldn't put two and two together. So other people were helping. But I couldn't. And so needless to say, that was, that was how I got going. How hard was it to unwind your, your, how hard was it to get out of Fuse? Were there venture backers or what was, or? It, because we were so close to the edge, it was not hard. Okay. And then I was able to pull a lot of people over because I couldn't hire from other people, other teams inside of Apple, because they, they were already strapped. We, I could take just a few people or a bunch of people from Fuse. That was the beginning of the team when we added other people around the edges and stuff like that. So I, I, I want to get to the iPhone, but one last iPod question. So how much of, um, iPod was a success, but how much of the real sort of, um, the, the real success of iPod was I, the, the combination of iTunes and iPod? Oh, the whole, the whole experience was designed so that you did all the difficult stuff on the computer where you had all the... Right from the start? From the start. Really? I th you did all your organization, all your yeah. playlist management, all your ripping. You did everything over there, and then you just transferred, and it was only a consumption experience over here. You only consumed. You did all your other stuff but did, over did, there. Did, didn't iTunes come afterwards? No, iTunes oh, was, so first. I was first. iTunes okay. was first. Yeah. Yeah. People were ripping CDs and then burning CDs. And then there was MP3 players, and then people were trying to get music onto them, and, they were and there was Diamond Rio and stuff. And the, the experience was so horrible, that's when they called me up and said, we think there's a better way. So who coined the, the marketing phrase, a thousand songs in your pocket? You know, that is, the, I think, the best marketing tagline you've ever heard, in the fewest words ever, to communicate what it was. And that was um, the agency did. Interesting. The agency, Interesting. yeah, shy it. So uh, you got a huge success, but there is this, the, 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 on the horizon, there's this. It thing. wasn't that much of a success the first two years. Two years. The but first quarter, it went to all the Mac loyalists. And then after that, no one bought it. Because 
it only worked with a Mac. So how many, okay. right? It didn't work with PCs. Okay. And Got Steve that hoped that people were gonna buy Macs to buy iPods. I was like, Steve, how much does an iPod cost? He goes, 399, I go, no. 399 <laughs> plus 2,000 bucks. Yeah, yeah. Right, and so that, then we finally, you know, Walt, the old Wasp, Ma, Ma, Mossberg story and yeah. then we shipped it on the PC. But ultimate, ultimately smartphones or, or, or whatever feature this world, phones. feature phones, feature phones. They're, they're a potential threat to your business. They were existential threat. Yeah. So is, is that what led directly to the iPhone? Well, it led to, to the Motorola Rocker. Oh yeah. So you might remember the <laughs> ill fated Motorola had, Rocker, yeah. which was a disaster. Yeah. Steve hated it. He like he didn't even want to demo it on stage. It was so bad. Um, and that was when we got absolute religion that we are going to build our own thing. And it was going not going to be a phone with software. It was going to be a computer with a phone. And two prototype sort of paths started P1 and P2. No, no. When did it that was there was first the iPod phone. So that, but didn't that become P1? No. No. There was the iPod phone. So imagine the iPod as a phone. And you would dial a number with that, right? Hi. But you could never make that work. You could we never. Could ne it was just a rotary phone. It was like when, you know, Alexander Graham Bell, you know. Like, <laughs> like when I grew up. Like, but everybody know. knew how to use it. All the old people knew how to use it. Yeah. Well, I don't, you know, it wasn't quite the, a great experience. But we tried like 30, 40 different ways to make that thing a phone and it didn't work. And then we m built P1, and then we threw that away, and then we made P2. And P1 had also the, the, the circular model? No, P1 was actually a full, what you would consider uh, an iPhone today. But not multi-touch? No, it had multi-touch. Okay. The thing is, it was in a iPod mini case. So if you see that iPod, the blue iPod, that was what I was, was designed. So it was rounded on the edges, okay. you'd insert it through, and it was this thing. But because of the, the aluminum structure, we couldn't get any signal because you couldn't get any antennas to work, right? Yeah. So we built this whole thing and then we became this like Frankenstein because we had to have all these big plastic caps on it. The design was horrible. Like we just, we were all newbies at designing a, you know, kind of a cell phone plus computer. Yeah. So we threw it all away and said, okay, what would we have done differently? And like, okay, and then that's when we're like, let's make it easy, do a plastic back and da 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 to yeah. make the iPhone. Yeah. Happen. So one of the puzzling aspects of Isaacson's book on jobs is he puts two stories uh, forward uh, uh, to explain uh, multi-touch. Um, one story has uh, Steve going to a dinner with Bill Gates and um, let's see, there's a guy who sort of describes how you have a tablet of the future with a stylus. So, so what happened was this was, so Lorreen had a friend, her a girlfriend had a husband, and they came over to dinner to Steve's house, because Steve would tell us this story all the time. And they came over, and this guy was annoying to Steve, okay? And he would always tell Steve, like, what they were doing in Microsoft, and like, pen windows was it, and like, da 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 And he was so annoyed by it, he's like, I'm going to show him how to goddamn do it right. I'm sick and tired of this guy. I'm sick and tired of hearing about Microsoft doing this thing. We're going to do it the right way, and it's going to have no stylus. <laughs> right? So that was the first thing where, like, stylus was not allowed. And I have a follow-on story to that one other day. But no stylus is allowed. You're going to do everything with your finger. Because you don't need, this is, this is your stylus. And everything's got to fit within your fingertip. But he didn't know about multi-touch. This was just a... a no, he didn't know about multi-touch yet. Yeah. Did not know about multi-touch. Ultimately, you found a company that had multi-touch technology, and you grabbed them. And yep, a tiny them. little little company that had multi-touch, yeah, yeah capacitive multi-touch. But there was a group within Apple who didn't buy in for a long time. They, they saw the BlackBerry experience, and they liked the keyboard without naming names. That's right. Well, look, it was the hottest thing selling, right? This little company in Canada all of a sudden was, you know, had all the profit, you know, in the cell phone business, had the most valuable customers, had a service, you know, because they had the email service. Like, it was the thing to beat. Yeah. It, was, it was a phenomenon, right? So how could you go cut against the grain when people were like, it was called Crackberry for a reason. Yeah, yeah. Right? But and so here you're, you're designing a competitor. When did you become sure of the idea of multi-touch as being a workable, how long did it take you to believe? It took about five months. 
because you know you start with a ping pong size multi-touch display, literally a ping pong table, that was a projector it projected a Mac and all the chips and all that stuff were around it to make it work. So you had to figure out if you could make a small touch screen. Then you had to figure out if you could make a keyboard, virtual keyboard, and then all the details to make the virtual keyboard actually work good enough to get things done. So you had this whole list of all these risks. And then we'd have to like every week march and march and march to get confident to then just say, we're jettisoning that and we're going to go this way. So all kinds of software mock-ups, software only mock-ups, hardware mock-ups, making hardware starting to work, doing touch screens that weren't multi-touch but single touch just to get the experience. So it was all of this, all of these crazy prototype things because we didn't have that to make it. So you had to did you, you feel kind like of, a, you know, uh, do a couple things and then use your imagination to see if it was going to Did Did you go. feel like the clock was ticking? Thank you. Did I know the clock? What? Well, do, you know, you're in a competitive industry. You're trying out a new technology. You spend six months on it. If it fails, if it doesn't work, you've wasted six months. Did you feel? Well, no, we did the iPod phone and we threw it away too. So yeah. the clock was always ticking, but it was ticking to find the solution, not to just settle. Right? Like we had to ship something. That's what most companies do. Yeah. Oh, just ship whatever because we have to do that. No, we shipped the right thing. That's why it took three different versions to actually, for the one to ship, the right one to ship. The other thing that's always puzzled me, I mean, there is, you know, you were competing against this Wintel world that traditionally had separated hardware and software and did them as separate things. And, you know, Apple's advantage was always the single unified experience. But inside, you had a design team, you had a hardware team, you had a software ID team. ID team, we had antenna teams, we had all kinds of stuff, right? So uh, how, did that, how did you make that work? I mean, sheer will. Like, it's just, we have to do this. And so everybody would be bonded together, like, we're going to go arm in arm and we're going to make this thing happen, right? And we would, e e different teams would try different ideas out and we would, the, the ideas would compete to see which one would win. So it was not like... We, but we were all knew that this is what we wanted to build. It was just how were we going to get there, and we had to evolve very quickly to find the, the right path, yeah. right? And so it was just a lot of people working on a lot of things all in parallel. We were boiling the ocean. We had to build our own touchscreen manufacturing, right? We had to build the touchscreen. We had to build chips for that. We made custom chips for the phone. We made all new software stacks, new operating system, new apps, all new modalities of how to use the thing. So it was every single thing was new. There was, a, you know, except maybe the DRAM. We didn't do DRAM and Flash, but literally the power supplies, were, everything was new. So the, the, you, you basically built a, I mean, the touchscreen was a company in itself. The touchscreen was a company in itself. Were, were you involved in that? Yes. I mean, like, yeah, like, you know, when Steve put the big thing in, you know, the big ping pong table in front, it's like, well, this is what we're going to put on this little device. It was a ping pong table. <laughs> you think we can make this into, I'm like, well, talk, walk me through, you know, I'm like, there was no, there was no unobtainium there, there was no, like, law, breaking laws of physics, it was just a lot of hard work, now, you had a, you could have a lot of risks, and maybe it all fell over, but you could see the steps you needed to take to work out each of the risks, yeah. and that's what we had to do. But, you know, we did crazy stuff like three months before the iPhone shipped, we moved from plastic on the top to glass. If anyone understands anything about hardware engineering, three months before production, you're going to switch from plastic to glass and all the drop testing, and it's going to, and you're like, you drop it, it's going to, you know, plastic, shatter. Plastic scratch, that's why you the, Yeah, the plastic would scratch because you'd have keys in your, right, because we had it on the iPhone, or like, excuse me, the iPod, because yeah. it had plastic and it would scratch. So it's like, we got to go glass. I'm like, holy sh... It was, we were moving mountains, yeah. right, to get glass on it and redesign everything in three months after we had already showed it to the world. So what's the bad day working for Steve Jobs like? A bad day? <laughs> A bad day is either one where he assumed where he assumed that you were covering something and you guys were seeing eye to eye on something. Like, it happened on just before the iPod ship. There was this big thing. Because he assumed it was going to be this way when we were designing it that way, and we never really talked about it. But there was a good reason why we did it that way. So it was usually kind of this 
mismatch of how it was going to, his expectation versus what was being delivered. Or we overlooked something. You know, we being the engineering team or the design team or something and like, oh shit. <laughs> We're going to have to tell him that, right? And then it was like, you know, it was, you know, it was a interesting discussion. I, I also heard you know, that the, I, the, the phrase, I'm going to dress you down now, you know, was heard a few times. Okay. I also heard that if you stood up and pushed back, that Steve would often come around. That if you were really committed to your ideas, that he would ultimately adopt your ideas and then they would become his ideas. <laughs> okay, so first. There are fact-based decisions and there are opinion-based decisions. You could almost always win the fact-based decisions if you put in enough work and get enough data to present the facts. You could win those. Opinion-based decisions, good luck. Because <laughs> there was one guy with, who held the, the opinion. But if you came with five, six, seven people, he trusted their opinions. And we were all singing the same song, going, this has to be this way. Let me show you enough reasons from all the different angles. You could then get him to change. It wasn't easy, but you could do it. Yeah. But then he saw that we were all, you know, we were aligned and we're like, this is the right thing, Steve. You know, listen, listen, listen. And he would, he would, do, he would definitely move. So it was not like, you know, but there were certain things like no stylus was like a big deal. Like, no. No, and like it was, or, and then at some point when the keyboard was working enough, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah, yeah. you know. Um, so you came to this, you know, with a, a decade of uh, ten years of sort of being in Silicon Valley without a big success. You're at General Magic. You're at Philips. Can you sort of name, sort of, what did you learn from 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 failure, and was that did it serve you well at Apple? Oh, absolutely. Well, okay. So first thing was, like I said, you know, scope the project. Don't have a four-year project. We did a, like a four-year project at General Magic, right? We know what happens. The world changes a lot in four years. And today, really, it changes a lot. But scope it so you can deliver something so that the team, it doesn't become an Apollo mission or like a Bay Bridge project that takes two generations to get done. Do something that gets in a year or a little bit longer than that so you can keep the team together and motivated. So one was scoping it right and shipping. Great artists have to ship. Don't keep adding stuff. So that was the first thing. Then the next one was make sure you're solving a need that people are going to have in some time real soon, right? I communicate. Then don't just have that and, uh, and then make sure it's a great design, but then make sure you understand the sales and marketing of how you're going to get it and the messaging for why people need it and make sure you have it properly. Because you can make all this stuff, but then if you wasted all your money and you have nothing left to sell it and you don't know how you're going to sell it, well, shit, you can build anything, but can you sell it? So yeah, that was another lesson learned, right? So it was all of these kinds of failure upon failure upon failure upon failure. Like, then you kind of realize, oh, this is kind of the recipe for success now. Yeah. Right? And then Steve then took it to the next level, which was total experience. Marketing, packaging, all the accessories, all the, you know, just making sure you had this, in, this entire experience from from the time they saw the first ad to the time it was unboxed, the time, you know, all those details. Yeah. So, you know, very, very interesting. Let me put you on the spot. Um, you know, from being around the Valley for a long time, one of the things I like to say is the visionaries are always wrong. Um, and so you've lived through sort of two, what I think of as two big generations of computing. I mean, more than lived through them. You've created two generations of computing. One is personal computing. And the other is kind of the flip side, ubiquitous computing, where, you know, I, I don't know who said it, but, um, um, you know, computing disappears into everyday objects and they become magic. I mean, you built one. It was called, it was called Nest. Uh, you built three, actually. You know, the music player combined with computing, the phone combined with computing, and the thermostat combined with computing. So, uh, what's next? What's next? In terms of generational, it, can you see your way to something beyond ubiquitous computing, which is, or Internet of Things, where we are now? Is there, if you had to sort of say, what's the next? 
big thing in Silicon Valley? What's the next big thing in Silicon Valley? I think it's reapplying all this technology to other fields. You know, at some point, we've kind of given ourselves all these tools, but now it's reapplying these tools and really disrupting the other fields. Like a lot of times, if you talk, you know, just before, there wasn't a lot of computing in biology. You know, maybe there were spreadsheets and there was little trackers and communication, but truly doing computational biology. Okay, great, right? We're there. So it's taking all of these resources and then reapplying it to other fields. Like we're seeing it now with autonomous driving, right? Take all this stuff, put new sensors on it, and now we're enabling a whole new set of functionality that the world's ever seen. So I think it's about bringing these kinds of capabilities into these other realms and disrupting them and changing them. Yeah. Because we've gotten to a place where we have a ton of functionality of what we need on our person. Yeah. Now let's put all these things around us and take them I'm, to the next I'm, level. I'm going to start asking audience questions because we're into that part. I have a couple more things I want to ask you. Um, um, and, and now for something totally different. Um, two questions. Will Apple build a car? And how would you design an Apple car? <laughs> Will Apple build a car? I don't know if they're going to build a car. Um, Steve and I had walks about building a car. Um, we would walk around the IL campus and what would we do differently, you know? Um, but I, I think if you're going to build a car today, you have to really understand the, a car was a kind of a one size fits all thing. Like it works in a city, it works in, on highways, it's all this stuff. I think we're quickly, you know, get, now that I live in Paris and stuff, you see there's different forms of mobility inside of different types of areas. And I think you're gonna see much more specialized transport than you do today, which is more, you know, one size, kind of one size fits, same morphology. Yeah. So I think that's gonna change because when you can only drive 25 miles an hour inside a city and you're seeing like Paris is gonna ban certain things or certain cities are banning things like traditional cars, you're gonna be able to have different safety metrics and you're gonna have different, like if they're self-driving, they only run 30 miles an hour, right? You're gonna ha you don't have to have all the safety gear. And when they can bounce off each other or not collide into each other, yeah. you're gonna have a different kind of thing. So I think you have to really, not think of the morphology of a car as you see it today, it's going to be very different based on what you really need. Because a lot of cases in an urban area, you may not even own it, yeah. right? Or maybe it's in a campus or it's two-wheeled or something like that. At one point, I counted more than 20 self-driving startups and big companies in the valley alone. Do you think there's a hype cycle and will there be a it's shake? Total, it's a total hype cycle. In fact, I just got in my email because I read this stuff. It says, We've mapped the 635 most important startups in doing autonomous cars. It's like 635, <laughs> right? Yeah. And if you remember when the cars came out in the, in the 20s and the teens and stuff like that, yeah. there were hundreds of brands doing stuff. So we're at that stage. We're at that Cambrian explosion of stuff. Yeah. So we're going to see different brands. We're going to see different things. There's going to be all kinds of change. So like it's all these little teams all trying stuff, but it's all going to consolidate over time. Yeah. Um, but that's what it takes. It's like, you know, it's just when there's a, just like we have AI, you know, AI applied to all these different areas. So it's just the normal, like how many PDA companies did we have in 1990 between the Newton and Go and EO and Momenta and General Magic and da 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 da, da right? And then, yeah. Right. So it's, it's that same kind of, and now there's so much money around the world that everybody tries. Yeah. Uh, how far away f are you today from being a kid in high school or college with your Apple II? Um, you've come a ways. Um, would you ever dive into one thing again? You're, you're running an incubator now, which by definition means you've got your hands on, what, 20 or 30 projects at any one time? Or more. So do you ever miss, I mean, so now you're in this new, you, you got this new life. Do you ever miss having one thing, just one project? You know... I've come to realize over time that I love doing lots of different things and I'm curious about all kinds of different things. And so when I get to work with all these teams, I get to be a kid again with them in each of, in each of these things. So I get to learn about computational biology or I get to learn about agri-tech agri 
or I get to learn about food technology or fin technology. And you get, start to see the parallels between each of these areas. So for me, I get to see a palette of things. And through that, maybe one day I, you come up with a good idea, but you don't just come up with a good idea. It took two years to come up with Nest after the Apple experience, right? So you gotta immerse yourself because I don't think it's just, you know, like I said, it's gonna be these overlaps. And that's why Nest happened, it was this overlap. So you have to go through all these experiences and see the need and see different technologies and kind of take from there and take from there and put together something new. So maybe one day it'll, it'll be that way. But right now it's exploring and, and having fun with lots of different technologies and teams. And maybe there's something that bubbles up from that, you know, in years from now. Here's a question, speaking about things that might bubble up. Augmented reality, virtual reality, will they happen and when? So, kind of like General Magic in 1991 with, you know, personal mobile communication. Like I said, I was doing VR in 1988 when Jaron Lanier, right, he was the VR guy of the time, right, doing, we were doing VR in 88. So, fast forward, we're talking 30 years almost, and we're still talking about VR, and it's still having fits and starts getting out. All the work that I've done on VR, because we even did VR glasses or a sort of VR at Apple with the iPod that we never shipped. Um, and then doing AR when I was doing a lot of augmented reality work over the years. I truly believe AR is going to be transformative. The technology isn't right yet. There's a lot of things that happen and it's, going to, it's not going to be in the consumer area and it's going to go up. It's going to be at the because it's just too expensive now. So you see HoloLens, you see these different things. I truly believe that AR will happen. VR is really, you know, I think it could be a real gamer thing, a simulator, you know, for, you know, for people who want that. But I don't think it's anywhere near as powerful as an AR experience for a multitude of people in a multitude of applications. So the problem that, um, that, that Google ran into with Glass, which was called the glass hole problem, the, the sort of the social... Yeah, it's a social The problem. social, you know, looking away rather than looking you in the eye. I mean, that's, to me, that's an interesting challenge for AR. Do you see a way around? Well, to, I don't think... I think AR is not going to be about... Necessarily, it's going to be about you walking around with it all the time. It's going to be in certain settings where you're going to use it. It might be in group settings. When you're trying to visualize something that the, you know, between the team and, and communicate that way. So I, I, I think that you're gonna see m the hardware progress rapidly, but it's gonna still take time. You know, we hear about all this stuff, just like self-driving cars are gonna be here in two years. Bullshit, mm -hmm. right? The same thing's gonna happen. Like the one, <laughs> the one thing I've heard, you know, it's like, just like when we did General Magic with the PDA, like it's coming, like I've been tempered by those experiences and, and understand that it, there's a lot of moving pieces to get there. Even though you show it, you know, yeah. it's going to take time for the, to really to sink into society, yeah. right? Not sure I understand this question, but I want to read it. Maybe we can understand it together. You succeeded where Sony Walkman had failed in ensuring that people would be isolated sonically from the people around them with the iPod. Did you deliberately set out with the iPhone to isolate us visually so we don't have to hear or look at each other? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a mean question? What, what's a no, it's basically, look, look what you've done to our society, <laughs> right? Look at you. So I, so I wake up sometimes in cold sweats because I think about that. Yeah. And I think about the impact of the creations that I've been involved with and how it has impacted society so dramatically over the last... 10 years or even before that. I remember uh, a wife of someone in the audience coming, well, you really isolated everyone with those iPods or the earphones because no one wants to talk to each other. But then I looked at it the other way, which is so many people are experiencing so, many, so much music that they would see each other and go, what are you listening to? And it was like a connecting in a way, like, oh, you like music. So there's different ways of looking at it. But I also, who in here saw the, the movie Steve Martin's The Jerk? Anyone remember, <laughs> anyone remember, do you guys, does anyone remember, I'll tell you real quick. So what did Steve, what was the jerk all about? This most average guy, you know, whatever. One day he's working at a gas station, this guy has glasses on, and the glasses can't stay on his face. So he's like, oh, I'll fix that for you. And he makes this technology 
the glasses handle <laughs> that's on the bridge of the glasses, and you do this. You don't have to do this anymore. And he's like, oh, my God, you're a genius. Oh, this guy, yeah, and he turns out to be this rich guy, and he was like, I'm going to fund this thing. We're going to start a company. And everybody thought the glasses handle was the biggest technology in the world. It's going to save humanity, right, from bad glasses. So he becomes a billionaire. <laughs> Five years later, everyone starts going cross-eyed because they're looking at the glasses handle. <laughs> and they, he becomes the most hated person in the world. He destitute, lost everything. So I think about that and go, when, <laughs> when the kids are looking at, you know, the digital screen and different pictures are coming up, and there's grandpa, me, yeah. or whatever, some old pictures, and they go, am I going to be hated by them for what we've created? Yeah. Or are we going to be, like, you know, still, like, is it yeah. going to be Alexander Graham Bell bringing light to society, or do we bring nuclear yeah. weapons to society? I don't know which it is. You may have but I, I wake up in cold sweats. I, you know, I worry about that all the time. Yeah. You know, I hope in houses, and this is one of the things that we were trying to do at Nest, is to have less screens, not well, was, more screens in homes. I was going to ask you, did you see what Amazon... Yeah, yesterday, yeah. So what do you think? They, uh, Amazon introduced something called the Amazon Echo, what was it called, Look? Echo Look? Show. 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 Echo show. What do, you, what do you think? It's showing the world and what, because we mock this stuff up too. It's showing the world there is so much visual information we get from looking at each other, right? The difference between a phone call and a teleconference, right? Or a video conference. That what you're not getting is enough hints from the device when you're just speaking at it. You're not getting enough feedback. I don't know if you need a display. I've, we've come up with other ways of doing it. I don't know if you need a display. I think that's, a, it's too, that's too easy to yeah. put on there. I think there's other ways of do subtle clues to know when it knows that, you know when you're talking to somebody and you're like, their eyes glaze over and you're like, oh, they're not getting it, <laughs> right? How does that, how, how do you get that kind of empathetic connection to know if it's understanding you? So they added that. I hope that we can figure out a way to not have to have yet another screen in the house. Yeah. Right? So we'll try it. We'll see what happens. You know, we had Audrey. What was it? What was it? Cisco Audrey? Was it Cisco or 3Com? 3Com Audrey. 3Com. You know, like 17 years ago. Didn't go. It's right back. There. Yeah, dancing dogs, right? They're impressive that they happen at all. Right. So we'll see if it's, it's there. But, you know, the, I think a voice interface in the home is really, really powerful. Yeah. And uh, kudos to Amazon for showing the world the way. This one, somebody in your family must be here because this question. Um, uh -oh. It's kind of a classic softball, but I'll ask it because it's an audience. Question. To what do you attribute your salesmanship abilities and your sense of humor? <laughs> <laughs> what? I think the, my, sal my dad was a salesman, okay. right? Okay. And I, went to, I got to go to, with him to Manhattan and go into these sales meetings where he would be selling fashion or whatever. And, you know, he taught me some really important things, which were like, look, if you don't have something, an honest thing you can sell someone, and you know of a better thing, tell your customer that. Because they'll always come back to you because you're going to tell them the truth. You're not going to just sell them what you have. You're going to sell them or sell them what, or tell them where they can get what they want. Like that was like really important yeah. like lesson. And like, you know, there's a lot of sales cultures out there. We know some of them even in the Valley. And he despised those things, which were that, you know, now we call it program, programmers, right? But there's this kind of real bravado in sales team. And he was like so against that. And he taught me like, don't do that. You sell the truth. And then again, that was what Steve said. You know, he was rang loud and clear. It's like, if you have a true story and you tell it honestly in a compelling way and you believe it, it's not just some script you were given, and it comes from your heart. People will follow you, and you can change the world with that. And through those those kind of tidbits, that's where I, you know, I learned that, like, be honest and be passionate. If you really believe it, and be passionate, and be prepared if to, you know, to lay your, lay it all on the line to get what you believe in, right? And if it's not working, move on, yeah. right? Because you're not talking to the audience that's resonating with. Yeah. But also listen, and also do a good job of listening, right? And so the other thing that I was taught through my, my grandparents, my grandfather, my father, and Steve, 
talk in analogies. Always talk in analogies that when you're talking about new technologies, new things, something that people can relate to that they do in everyday life so they understand the transition or whatever it was. Because as soon as you can connect at that level, then people are like, okay, you have now given me a superpower and you've explained it to me in a way that I feel empowered. You're not talking above me like some scientist or some legal legalese or whatever it is. You're talking to me on my level and you're giving me tools and a way to communicate about those tools to make me feel like I have a new superpower yeah. that I can communicate to other people and feel special. Yeah. So uh, a last question. Um, so uh, s s let's say you show up now, 20 years after the fact, you're a kid, you show up here in the valley. Um, what would you tell someone similar to you who just walked in, you know, wet behind the ears in Silicon Valley today? You are going to work very hard. You are going to have a ton of failure. Do not read the popular press that all of these startups all make it. You're going to work your butt off. You're go it's going to take a decade or a decade and a half to actually, if you want to live this dream, be prepared that that's what it's going to take. Now, and make sure you ask for help for everybody around you because that's what the Valley's all about, is that, you know, I'm only up here because of many people in this audience who helped me get here, right? And that, make sure you extend a hand when you're asked for help, and these people will extend a hand when, when you ask for help, yeah. right? And that's the magic of Silicon Valley. It's that thing, and I hope we don't lose it. It seems like we're starting, it's getting diluted, because it's all about mine and backstabbing. Like, you know what it was like in, this, in the 80s here in the 90s. Like, it was like we we're all trying to make this new world together. And, we would, and it was not about this company versus this. It was about the relationship you had with each of the people that you worked with. And when they went to the competition, because that's what they want to do, you still stayed friends. It wasn't like this, right? And, you know, my best friends right? 25 years. We've been competing. We've been on the same team. We've had, but it's that human element that continues to move forward. And now the babe, you know, the babies that were born in General Magic, I was like, I couldn't wait to have them be interns and come to my team and be on my team. Like, and we watched that cycle of mentorship happen, right? And I hope that in the next 20, 30 years, I'm going to be able to do what those people who helped me to give back to other, you know, uh, you know, twenty-something, thirty-something who have they have their dreams to help them with theirs, not just in Silicon Valley, but hopefully around the world, because I think that's the way we continue to exist as a society, um, because we're not just going to all be behind screens competing with each other, because that's yeah. that's not what this is about. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for this little window into this little bit of Silicon Valley history. Uh, join me in giving uh, Tony a hand. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I just, I just want to say thank you to all the people in this audience and around Silicon Valley for, for all the help you've given me over the last 25 years. And uh, if I can ever help, you know where to Happen. find me. So thank you. Thank you.